we are live okay. so good morning everyone i welcome you all to the last day of resource scholars day 2021 the annual research festival of iit madras this year's rsd began with a plethora of events ranging from lecture series to interactive talks and workshops to competitions the festival has been seeing a convolution of researchers academicians entrepreneurs and industrialists across different domains i would like to start the day with a glimpse of this grand research festival along with the lineup of events for the day it gives me great pleasure and honor to introduce you to the speakers for the first session of the day so please put your hands together for mr prashant thawan and ms seema anand welcome sir and ma'am to rst 2021 thank you for joining us with us today mr thawan is a co-founder and director of biomimicry india network and biomimicry india lab and studio his research focuses on issues related to sustainable happiness and joy he did his bachelor's from the delhi school of planning and architecture an ms in biomimicry from the arizona state university usa driven by the quest to find his passion he has crowned many fields like architecture business management and biomimicry which led him to be the founder of one of the leading enterprises in the domain our second speaker for the session ms seema anand is a biomimicry specialist from biomimicry 3.8 institute usa and a practicing architect in bangalore She is also a co-founder and director of Biomimicry India Network and Biomimicry India Lab and Studio. She also consults and teaches biomimicry in the field of design. The title for their today's talk is Biomimicry: A Nature Integrated Design Thinking and Lessons from Nature for Succeeding in the Post-COVID World. Now I would like you to invite Sir and Ma'am to deliver their talks. So over to you, Sir and Ma'am. Good morning. Good morning to everyone, uh, and uh, thank you to IIT Madras especially for inviting us. So, uh, before we start, uh, I want to just say we have just one hour, and biomimicry involves 3.8 billion years of accumulated knowledge of nature. So, we would try and cover uh, basically the broad. subjects of what is biomimicry why now how is it relevant and some ideas of possible applications especially in the post covid world i am very happy that this event is called shunya and i saw that shunya is being called a restart and we are going to see that it's a huge opportunity or a challenge depends on where we look at things so we will not go into very deep uh, domain specifics of biomimicry which i am sure a lot of you know much more about you know biomimicry is applied everywhere right from aerospace to mechanical to chemical but we would 
we would limit ourselves to the broad approach and try and see what is different is it just a new word the new fashion word earlier we said sustainability today biomimicry day after something else will come is that or is there something deeper for all of us i think these are the questions which we should ask and i'm sure you you will be asking before i start my sense is maybe maybe this is something which we should look deeply we should collectively own and build on uh, so we'll now start and after the talk we'll have time for questions and then we'll collectively explore the opportunities that biomimicry throws for us so so let's start by acknowledging the moment i think it would be unfair to just start and assume it's business as usual is it business as usual if it was business as usual i wouldn't be on a laptop with all of us locked in our homes many of us for almost a year so it's 4th april 2021 we are in the middle of a pandemic covid 19 it is an unprecedented pause and thank you for calling it shunya because a pause mean you have the ability to restart because if you don't pause then how do you restart you are already in motion so many things have been paused and should we go back to old ways or it is an opportunity to restart so let's just sit back and uh, start with a little bit of a fun quiz we'll start with a fun quiz which is very simple so this is a logo can anybody guess well i can't see anybody but but if, if somebody can guess what this brand is if uh, maybe a nurag or somebody sees the response has anybody guessed what this brand is has anybody uh, can i get an indication very cool very cool yes yes very yes. cool i am sure everybody really knows this brand and this is an adhesive right everybody knows this is an adhesive we know it we see it every day and most of us have used it now look at this new uh, other graphic this is the photograph of a lizard or a gecko now this also has an adhesive on its foot pads and this is an adhesive which is all around you often you find these litter lizards or geckos running upside down on the ceiling ahead in you know just on top of your head that is sticking unsticking while in motion and carrying a load most of you are extremely qualified engineers tell me which is a better adhesive the logo that you see on top or the adhesive which is non toxic which doesn't leave anything which is on the foot of the lizards or geckos we see every day around us similarly what you see on the left and right extremes is a muzzle this is a muzzle which you find in seashores iit madras is next to the sea if you go next to you'll find on seashore they're very slimy rocks and these muzzles are sticking onto these rocks and there's a huge amount of tidal pressure in spite of that they keep on sticking and these are not produced using any chemical processes or toxic chemicals yet they adhere so this is waterproof adhesives not only waterproof but also taking care of cyclical force which is trying to pull them apart so now tell me which is a better adhesive these or that logo i think a lot of you might know it but in my heart of art and my experience i realized a lot of us have stopped noticing the technology which is around us you know it's a pause let's evaluate our own way of looking at things okay now let's another quiz what is this let's see who can guess um, youtube you must be sure watching on youtube I, if i get an indication somebody has found it please let me know what brand is this asian paints asian paints asian paints okay paint company we all know our paint companies you know and interestingly the earlier company and this company are not more than 50 year old but the technology of the lizard and all is probably a million year old we might not know it so let's see how much attention we are paying to technology and the knowledge around us now let us see 
Now these paints that we know so well, they we know that we have a problem that these fade over time. There are rain, dust, uh, ultraviolet uh, radiation, they fade. But all of us have seen birds. These are peacock feathers, our national bird. Please tell me, have you seen faded peacock feathers? Now, peacocks don't have the luxury to protect themselves from rain, ultraviolet radiation and all dust. And often these feathers are passed from generation to generation. They don't seem to be fading. So now tell me which is a better color technology. This one or the one which has been dancing all around us, but we've stopped noticing. Similarly, on top is the lotus leaf, a sacred plant in India. Why is it sacred? Because we say that the lotus leaf never gets dirty. In spite of growing in a dirty water, it doesn't get dirty. And that's because of the microstructure of its surface. And yet we have only now we've started hearing about paints which will not get dirty. So I wanted to start with this to, to use this pause to calm down our cleverness and just see things, see ourselves for what the way we are learning, the way we are existing. My humble submission is we might be becoming so economy present that we might be becoming place blind. We might be becoming nature blind. There is so much around us, but we are so caught up in the urgency of day-to-day -day competition with each other. There is an intellectual uh, race going on. Who gets how many citations? Who gets this? So are we missing out? Are we missing out of the beauty and the technologies all around us? And let's put our hand on our heart. I'm sure I, I give you this slide within 10 seconds. Most of you, 99% will know everything about all these, not more than 50 year old technologies. But if I give you this question, then now can you identify 10 functional technologies which are better than human solution in the plants and animals that you see every day? I bet at least 99% would take an hour or maybe we'll go to Google and search. And these things have been around for often billions of years. I want to start with that because this is a moment at least things are in a pause. And also let's just realize what is this pause about? Could you even think about such a possibility? What has paused? What has paused is some of the economic activities, some of the social activities. And why? Because we couldn't pause life can you pause life try please try we cannot pause life why i say this in such a dramatic way because often we forget we forget the purpose for which we created institutions like engineering uh, medical business politics and we forget so much that these institutions take a life of their own only when such a moment when we realize that we can pause these institutions is a good time, as you said, Shunya, to, to look at things. That, so let's, let's look. This is what seems to be happening. In our pre-COVID world, we were busy, busy like a caterpillar, consuming in a race. And quite honestly, uh, I think we had started looking at nature as a raw material. I don't know what you have experienced, but in most of my engagements, I find that people were looking at nature and thinking, how do I shape the environment so that it fits in and nourishes the economy? So much so, it is my uh, observation and just check if it's true in your thing. I find that we have also started looking at society and our own fellow human, human beings as raw material, we are thinking, how do I shape human beings to fit into the economy and nourish the economy? Isn't it so? Even our own children, we are trying to shape them so that they fit into the economy. It's a good moment. Shunya is a good moment. This pause is a good moment. 
we have paused the economy. So what does it tell us? What it tells us is what is the economy? Economy is a tool. It's a servant that we created to serve us. And if your servant has become your master, and we have in our hurry, we have not, we have lost that memory, then I don't think we'll get real answers to real solution because we are using the wrong framework. We are beginning to assume something that we have created, which is only available in our imagination. Try and explain economy to a dog or a plant. We'll realize, and if, tomorrow, if right now an, a tiger comes into your room, believe me, you will forget about the economy. You will be very clear that it's all about biology. In fact, a lot of us have this moment when you have an accident or you're, you suddenly become very lucid and you realize, ah, and then we lose out the next phone call comes, you have an exam or you have a target. So a pause sometimes is good. And so Shunya, I mean, let's use this Shunya to calm ourselves down and see things. So my, my view of this moment, of this pause is that let's, it's a time to reflect. And as you said, maybe restart or reset. So we see how quickly we paused our economic and social systems because you can't pause life because everything that we created is in service of life and life with a capital L, all life, not just human life, because you all, most of you are scientists, you realize everything is interconnected, interlinked, you can't look at things in isolation. So the right model, right in the beginning, we have to begin by getting the framework right. What is the framework? The economy is our tool, our servant, which should be designed to be in service of society, and society is but a small subset, a small subsystem in the larger ecology. And the society should be so designed so that it's in alignment with the ecology. That's it. No rocket science. So until unless we get our model right, we can be busy looking busy. And I'm sure a lot of you know what I mean. Most of us are now busy looking busy. We don't want to look that we are. But is there meaning in such kind of work where the frameworks are wrong? So I want to provoke, I want to use this session more to provoke the larger questions. Let's use this Shunya. That we need to now, we have the opportunity to look at purpose. So we had designed the economy that it was no longer possible of, for us to pay attention. And we realize what happens. So how do we create a framework where without doing extra effort, we are always mindful of the implications on uh, on ecological systems and that's where biomimicry comes in so interestingly while all these things are happening i would also think our generation especially yours and the young people in iits and other this is also a great 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 moment while we are in a pandemic we also are at the threshold of unprecedented capabilities. You've got quantum computing, artificial intelligence, nanotechnology, additive manufacturing, the kind of capabilities nobody ever had, I think, in earlier generations. But at, while you have these capabilities, you also have huge problems like pandemics, climate change, biodiversity depletion, environmental depletion, poverty, waste. And I would challenge you to say that even unemployment is a waste. Let's use this calmness to see outside of the industrial human being. Have you ever seen an unemployed species outside of humanity? Think about it. So is it a design fault? Or is it something you just live with and be busy solving something which in any case you are, it's your invention. So my claim is humanity, the industrial human being has invented unemployment. It is not a natural condition, it's a system error. And if we get our designs right, we can solve these problems. I'm going to challenge you today. So, and also waste. If you go to a million year old forest, do you ever see waste? We don't see waste. Waste is again a human invention. In fact, my sense is that if aliens are looking for humans, they must have told, look for a plastic bag. That's one indicator that a human has been there. So we are not doing too well. Let's have the humility to understand we are not doing too well. And there is a lot we can learn from nature. 
and that's very important because at one point you have these great capabilities and at another point you have these big problems so what do we want to do with these capabilities one thing is we will make our people give them a 3 crore salary so that they can make the next smartphone or we will say we'll use these capabilities put our best people so that they can solve these problems it's a choice but the choice will only work if our framework is right that economy and society should be in alignment with ecology so once we agree that we might have the resources the ability to change what we need is the right imagination and i am again going to make a big challenge i don't think we have a problem of resources we have a problem of imagination if we get our imagination right we already live in a sustainable world we have so many design flaws and we are going to explore that in during this uh, short session so gandhi once said speed is irrelevant if you are going in the wrong direction so as a scientist said that all of us are in a big bus which is going at a top speed and it is going to head in a ditch but out of habit we are fighting for the window seat okay you got the window seat what's the fun so i think it's time for us to see this is a slow down should we look at the direction where we are headed so we need to revisit common purpose we've realized that we can't just be human centered we can't be just economy centered and we can't be just technology centered we need to be life centered life with a capital l all life and if we agree on that then comes the smart question how is there a framework so let's just start looking at nature once ago so the good thing is if you start looking outside you'll realize we are not the first one to use sanitizers right now everybody is using sanitizers and doing social distancing but you know wood ants there are ants which have been using tree resins as a sanitizer or uh, anti pathogenic uh, agent to line their nest to line their bodies for millions of years so again we are not the smartest species this has been happening we just not noticed it we think we've invented it similarly we are not the first to practice social distances there is a damp wood termite and there are uh, th you know uh, temnothorax uh, ants once they get infected they keep a distance from the colony some of them will be very so altruistic they leave the colony the other will indicate that you know stay away from me so again we are not the first ones this has been happening in nature for so long similarly there is a species of ants lasius neglectus uh, they get infected by these fungal spores and uh, instead of uh, taking away the individual they actually clean up the infected individual but in turn they also get a low level of infection in the entire community so in many ways they acquire or in in a strip in a you could say a low level of vaccination is happening or herd immunity is happening so there we we go again so we are not the first ones to think of these things they have been happening in nature so we are nature we are not outside of nature and uh, coming closer to our industrial way of life what you see here are accidents right and i can almost promise you i can bet with you that wherever you are within a 100 km radius of wherever you might be in the last 4 5 hours some intelligent homo sapien must have had an accident with another homo sapien i can almost guarantee that whether it's a cycle running into a a, a cart or a car brushing <laughs> against a car and we have technology we have red lights we have rules we have police so many things but let's look at this other graphic you see these birds these locusts these fish which we see every day every day you know please tell me do you read reports today 15 birds had an accident or today 40 <laughs> have we ever seen and they don't apparently have the kind of technology and rules that we smart human beings have but are the rules of physics chemistry maths engineering different in these two technologies clearly we understand that the rules are the same it's just that we have not paid attention we have not paid attention and we have created such a divide between nature and engineering and nature that often although a lot of you now must be uh, reading about swarm intelligence and, and and so many of these rules but for a long time we've not been paying attention and i assure you in a current practices and education system a lot of these things are still not 
paid attention to. Similarly, we are big talking big about ca carbon sequestration as if it's a new idea, as if we've come up with something. If you look at our coral reefs, our soils, our trees, they've been sequestering carbon for billions of years. We are simply mimicking what nature was already doing, but we've given it a fancy word. Again, this is the arrogance of humanity. Uh, we, we just need to connect to nature and see how nature works. And it's been happening for billions of years. We give it big names. We give it restoration. But I ask, restore what? Eventually restore what? And for that, you have to restore what the way nature works. And to, to do that, you have to mimic nature. Similarly, ants, I'm sure wherever you are within maybe 200, 400 meters, ants are busy doing what they are doing. doing. And sometimes hundreds and thousands of doing uh, them in a team. Now let's keep our hand on our heart. How many of us have worked in a team? If I put 10 of you, 10 of us together, how simple it is. We all know how difficult it is to work in a team, to take a decision, to align everybody's behavior. Yet, how do these ants work so successfully in a team? After all, they are taking decisions. Tasks are getting accomplished. We might say that we don't understand it, but to say it's not happening is non-scientific. And to understand what are the design principles of decision making, that suddenly unlocks. And it's not that it's not being you today, especially in the internet of things and in algorithms. A lot of these algorithms are coming from ants, but there is still a lot of us don't even understand that the algorithms we are using actually came from understanding how ants take collective decisions. But the interesting, most interesting thing about ants is as against our organizations where nothing happens if you don't have a boss or you don't have a supervisor, ants don't have a hierarchy. They are self-organized. Wouldn't it be wonderful for us to have self-organized systems? But where do we look? Maybe we can learn something from the ants. It might not be an exact copy, but at least we should know. How come without a leader, they are such a successful species? Similarly, let's look at this. You know, we have these urban breakdowns, our roads break, and we all know what happens when the road breaks. We are cursing, Are nothing is happening. Then we do dharnas, morchas, we write to newspapers. Then the government takes out three tenders. By the time... Roads are even more broken, but we've all seen termite mounds. They are also like common infrastructures, millions of termites living together. It is common property. Now, don't break a termite mound, but if you find that a termite mound has been broken and you come visit it in two, three days, you'll find it's been repaired. Might not be the same shape, but it's been repaired. See, design-wise, the problem is the same. There's a multi-agent system. Something has broken. Now, every agent is feeling, is it my job? Do I take a requisition? Do I need a sanction? Whom do I get an approval from? Who will work? But how do they do it? Why can't we do it? We should at least have the curiosity. Now, of course, now we know they have a decentralized and distributed decision making system. They have decentralized and distributed uh, know how. Uh, but once we know it, we say, oh, now we can solve it. But mostly we don't even know. And the and the important thing is that we've stopped noticing. We've stopped asking these questions. So I just want us to take this pause and try and become earthlings. We are very good economic entities, but are we good planetary entities? Let's look at our planet. Our planet is actually 4.5 billion years old. And life has been around for 3.8 billion years. And all these living systems, we are, humanity is here only for 200,000 years. And it's a disclaimer. I am talking of what science currently tells us. If it changes tomorrow, well, you know, then that will be that truth. So in India, I would say, my friends, our elders, and we respect our elders. Our elders have been around for 3.8 billion years, from cyanobacteria to mushrooms to... So let's really acknowledge our true elders. And we have only come on Earth for 200,000 years ago. And out of that, only in the last 200 years did the Industrial Revolution happen. And most of our curriculum, even the institutions that we have created, whether it's engineering, uh, medical, were created in many ways uh, 
to support the industrial way of life. So they are not like gravity that they can't be changed. Maybe they need to change. They need to evolve. So often what we create as a servant becomes our master. And I want this little pause to give us the, uh, the ability to think that, no, no, we have created it. We can change it if, if our requirements are changed. So let's begin with the deep humility that maybe nature has already solved many of the problems we are grappling with today. It's just that we haven't created a system of a structured system of going and looking at nature and bringing these solutions to us. And the good thing is nature has been doing it for 3.8 billion years. And in 3.8 billion years, 99.9% .9 of the species have gone extinct, which is mean the beta testing is so rigorous that whatever survives today has a very high degree of, of being sustainable. While we have whatever we do, there is a very high risk of unintended consequences because whatever we do, we have been in, on Earth only for 200,000 years and our industrial revolution is only 200 years. So maybe we will do something and we don't know, maybe 100 years down the line, 1,000 years, it, it might have implications. So it is very important to have the humility to say, let's look at how nature does it. And the great part is nature has been very generous. Outside of the industrial human being, no other species on earth has taken intellectual property rights and blocked its information from anyone. So this, my friends, is the biggest creative commons. Again, we were not the first ones to come up with creative commons. Nature is the biggest creative commons. So this is giving us an opportunity to look at uh, strategies for free. And there is only one design brief if we look at nature and that design brief is create conditions conducive to life. The important thing is life means all life, not just human life. And now let's go into the structured part of biomimicry and uh, Seema will take us through how biomimicry has been structured. So if you're new to the subject, you might say, OK, that is very inspiring. I completely agree with you. But tell me exactly what is biomimicry and how is it practiced? Is it even possible to use this idea to create some real life products and real life solutions? So the second part of a presentation is exactly about that. And we're going to show you some case studies where this has been successfully done. But to start with, what is biomimicry? What is how is it formally defined? So. This is a definition by our institute where we've studied biomimicry. It's, it defines it as conscious emulation of nature's genius. Conscious implying that it is not left to chance or an interest of a few. It's very intentional now. There are tools and methods where anybody who's interested in the subject can actually learn it and use it to solve a human challenge. Emulation is not a slavish copy, but it is really learning the deep pattern and uh, a, a deep understanding of nature and then engineering it to solve our challenge. And nature's genius, as you've already seen, is because nature's been around much longer than us. Many organisms have mastered how to survive sustainably on the planet without really uh, causing any damage. And what can we learn from their solutions? So biomimicry is practiced at three levels. It's called form, process, and system. Form is really anything that you can see, measure, whether it's it's a shape or a texture, even at a nanoscale, because you can put a dimension on it. And in nature, everything has a certain shape or a texture to solve some kind of a function. So it can be a very powerful tool to solve many of our challenges. But there are other two levels. One of them is the process, that how are things made in nature? So what is the manufacturing happening and how does it happen in nature and what can we learn from it and the third and the most important level is systems because just like in a human world in the natural world everything is interconnected and interdependent so the planet functions like one entity and whatever we design we also have to understand how will it behave in a larger system so what can nature teach us at a systems level so true biomimicry is really realized when you practice all three, not just copy your form, but how is it made and how does it fit into a larger system? And for today's talk, uh, 
where we have filtered out four important questions which might be relevant to an engineering background. Uh, these are how, what can nature teach us about sustainable procurement of materials and services? Anything that you want to make in our world, you need material and services. And so does nature. I mean, we are seven, more than 7 billion people on the planet, 30 million species. Everything is made out of some kind of a material. There is a lot of service industry in nature, whether it's pollination, uh, etc. So you, we need, nature has a lot of lessons to offer. How, how does it do it? Or sustainable design, sustainable manufacturing, and once you've made a product about how do you maintain things and what happens to these products at the end of their life, uh, does it become like a linear system, which is wasteful, which, which is what we've been practicing by far. But in nature, everything works in a closed loop and how, how does it happen? So we are going to just take each of these questions and for each question, we are going to show you the deep patterns how nature solves this uh, functional problem and normally how what are we used to our industrial way of thinking how do we approach these problem solving so let's take our first question on what can we learn from living systems about procurement of resources whether it is energy or material so nature really uh, values what is abundant so nature by far run, runs on solar we value what is scarce so we, we our entire world depends on the fossil fuel. Nature uses what is local, only what is local. So organisms, whether it's trees, plants, insects, they don't have the luxury to mine something in Africa, assemble it in another part of the world and transport it to everywhere else. They have to work with the resources, what is immediately available and meet all their functional needs. And nature uses a very small subset of elements. We tend to use a very large subset of elements. So this really um, uh, implies about, you know, the various elements you study in our periodic table, we have more than 100 elements. And in our world, we use all of them. And this is the fundamental difference between nature's chemistry and ours, that nature uses very selectively about 28 materials and how everything is built with just these material. And that's how things, it's very easy to keep things in a closed loop. It's very easy to upcycle material, even move it from organism to organism and ecosystem to ecosystem. Yeah, just to tell you that the cell phone has one many more elements and materials in its making than these two human beings that are talking to you and your own body. So you can imagine how primitive our engineering is that we need to have 100 elements or in a, in a small cell phone. And while our own body is primarily 28 materials, actually four rest are traces. Uh, and why is it important? I just wanted to link it to our initial question that today we have these technologies and we have these problems. So where are the opportunities? So maybe now we have the opportunities when we can start replacing some of these materials because we are able to work at nanoscale at a molecular manufacturing we are able to have the computational abilities the only thing is we need to have the right imagination so we are saying that let nature provoke our imagination so this is an ex a biomimicry example on how the the conventional portland cement can be replaced by a greener uh, a carbon negative cement uh, and how engineers have successfully done is by just copying the recipe of how corals are made in seawater and how they are made is it's a biomineralization process of calcium carbonate in seawater which is abundant so calcium and carbon ions are abundant in seawater so what they've taken is that taken this recipe they are actually taking smoke coming out of car, uh, of cement factories and passing it through brine and by just the change of ph they are able to get a material not as simple as it sounds, but a material which has the same strength as Portland cement, but actually it is sequestering carbon. So in Portland cement, for one ton of cement, you would emit a ton of carbon dioxide. Here, for a ton of cement, you would sequester a ton, half a ton of carbon dioxide. So it's carbon negative. So what can we 
learn from living systems about design of products, processes, and systems. So in design, nature's uh, approach is really invest more in shape and information. Yeah, I just want to not in material. link it to the earlier question. So now we said that nature doesn't have a choice. It is limited with the few, very few elements. Now with, and the same thing an engineer will say that, how do I do all these things? You're saying you can't have so many. Now, how does nature solve it? Nature uses shape and information at a molecular level to achieve multiple functionalities. So that, that's how it is linked to the earlier question that how do you do these things given the new constraint? So you can take the example of a skin. It's the same same cell but by just the change of density how the same skin behaves on our skull uh, on our head to our toes and everything in between how this it, it has different properties different functions with just the same type of cell yeah, by fact, change of density yeah. in fact iit is already doing so much work on sandwich structures on density gradients if you really see at a fundamental level it is shape and information and this vocabulary can say now I restrict the canvas or of the materials, but I get multiple functionalities. So nature uh, designs everything for multifunctionality. So again, if we go back to our skin, it is actually a protective uh, a layer between outside and inside. It protects our internal organs. It is our biggest touch organ. And it is it also thermally regulates us. So by uh, you know, sweating or shivering, we control the body temperature depending on the environment that we are in. So it has many functions built into a same solution. Whereas most of the products we design are by far what we've designed are monofunctional uh, and how we can change this mindset that how everything we design can have more than one function. So nature uses optimal utilization of uh, any kind of resource. Whereas we are maximized towards one function. Yeah, to understand that, why is it doing that? Because in nature, investment of material is very, very high. Material or resource is very expensive. I'm, I don't want to use the word cheap, but information and design is cheap. You can keep on increasing complexity. In fact, the word information has form inside. So the complexity of form is how information is encoded. And that way you will find that in nature, very rarely an investment goes idle. So it might, so for example, our designs are so that something is doing very well along one use, but it's lying idle for most of the time. Now let's look at this, this little design difference and just by imagining a new way of living, we can see we can unlock so many of the resources. So in nature, there's hardly anything which is ever idle where there is, there is an investment of energy and resources. You know, even a territory where a lion is, while the lion is there, many other creatures are doing their own thing. And when the lion goes, somebody else comes. But let's look at the way we have designed our world. Anything which humans have designed to a great extent is resources, energy, lying idle. Let's look at vehicles. Most of the vehicles we own is so much technology. It's lying parked 95% of the time. In fact, the most expensive vehicles, the Lamborghinis, they are probably lying parked 99% of the time. If an alien was to come, he would laugh at us. What a dumb species, you know? They, I mean, in the lockdown, the migrants, <laughs> thousands of migrants are walking and our cars are like locked up. Yeah. It's a resource which we will not allow anybody to use. Yeah, we are victims of our own imagination. Nature didn't say that this is the only way. Nature said gravity cannot be changed, but this can be changed. So similarly, extend this logic to everything that we have designed. The table you are sitting on. Probably 90% of the time it's, it's lying, doing nothing the houses that we are living in. Now, I am not saying that there is something wrong, but we want to challenge our imagination. And is it too exotic? Observe what is happening without consciously realizing we've started shifting toward increasing your resource utilization by improving our design. What is happening? First came the carpooling, then they came 
businesses like Ola, Uber, they don't own a single car. They are simply decreasing the utilization. Now you are hearing of co-living, co-working. Airbnb. Airbnb. Now, instead of an accidental resonance with natural ways, what if we do this more consciously? Then we can accelerate, we can actually create abundance while decreasing resources and energy. It's a problem of imagination, not a problem of resources. So this is a very powerful principle. And, and I think engineers should be thinking that how can they increase? In fact, we've been challenging vehicle designers to see, can this vehicle do something else in 95% of the time that it's not doing anything? Now imagine the cell phone, it used to be a pager one day. Today it's become so important because the same investment in molecules is doing so many more functions. That's the kind of uh, evolution nature does. And I think that's the opportunity for us. Okay, a simple example of how biomimicry is used to design our products. This is a concept car by Mercedes inspired by a box fish. So this form was used to design a more efficient uh, car body, but they wanted to go a step further to reduce the material consumption to make this car. And they approached a tree biologist who's been studying tree structures for over 15, 20 years in Germany. And he's taken those algorithms on how tree branching happens and put it in a software. And now you can run any product in it and it, it has a function of soft kill where it removes the material where there is no load and makes things really lightweight. So they were able to make this car in one third the material and hence increasing the fuel efficiency even more. So what can we learn from living systems about manufacturing and construction? So once you have procured material, you have a design, you also need to make things. So nature uses additive manufacturing. We've been used to a lot of subtractive manufacturing where we mine, cut, chop, end up with a lot of waste. But if you look at trees, plants, uh, even our own bodies, the way the bones grow, cells and tissues are put one by one, they are added where it's needed, Sim same as trees uh, and other organisms. There is no waste. Material is not put in places where it's not needed. So a lot of all manufacturing in nature is self-assembled, where it's not made in any factory. There is no smokestack in, in, inside an ocean, or there is no assembly line. There is no transportation. Everything is made in body at ambient temperature. Uh, using no toxic chemicals because everything is made in, in body. So it cannot afford to harm living organisms. And he, as a result, there is no pollution. There are no long-term toxins left in, in sea, in soil. Yeah, and we normally tend to think nature is, you know, very made of soft materials, soft tissues. But if you look at ma materials like shells, which are really hard or our bones or teeth, they are hard materials and they are self-assembled, again, using very low energy processes. I mean, a shell is made with a protein layer which attracts through its charges, uh, calcium and carbonate ions to settle on, on a protein layer. And by combining a soft and a hard layer, by layering it, it's, it ends up making a very hard ceramics. Or you take spider silk, which if you take the, the thread of a spider silk, it's considered tougher than, uh, than even Kevlar. So in tensile strength, it is very strong. Um, and it is made by just eating some flies and, you know, some mosquitoes. It's really not made in factories using heat, beat, and treat, as we call it. So this is an in interesting example. Maybe some of you have seen it. Let me play this video where you see a yellow blob in the middle there are a lot of white spots around the center and you'll see this yellow material expanding all around first in a uniform manner and then forming a kind of a network you know so it's contracting from places where there is on some places and you know forming like a network so this is a time lapse video um, taken over 26 hours and this experiment was done by a giant Japanese engineer. And this yellow blob is nothing but a living organism. It's a single cell organism called slime mold. So in the natural living world, these slime molds 
who are just single cell, no neurons, but they have a lot of multinuclei. They attract other slime molds. They come together and behave like a single organism, like a super organism. And that's how they look, look out for food. So they spread themselves uniformly all around. If they find food, they will form this network and a nutrient distribution channels, which are considered one of the most efficient way to distribute food. And what this Japanese engineer did was he took a map of Japan. He put the center where he put these slime molds was actually Tokyo. And these white dots were oats, which he put in the neighboring cities. And he left these slime molds and he, he took a video. And what he found after 26 hours, they had formed a network where they located all these oats. So in a way, different cities and formed a network system, which, which is very close to the railway network of Japan, which is considered one of the most efficient railway network formed over hundreds of engineers using some very intelligent engineers. And these simple single cell slime molds did it in 26 hours. Yeah, so this is a brainless single cell solving a root optimization problem. You know. So now these, again, these are considered biological computers. They have been, algorithms have been derived on them that how do they form these efficient networks? And can we use this intelligence to uh, distribute any of our resources, which could be water, which could be server distribution or even transport systems? So what can we learn from living systems about maintaining functional health and managing waste. So as I said, once you've made something, you also have to maintain it. You also have to think about what will happen to this product at the end of its life. So nature uses uh, ideas like, or strategies like self-clean, self-heal. And of course, there's no such thing as waste. A byproduct of one organism is actually nutrient for somebody else, whereas we use Everything that we make has to be externally cleaned. It has to be externally repaired. There's no concept of self repair. And it, of course, there is a lot of waste we've generated over many centuries, which is lying in our marine waters, which is lying in our soil. So what, how can we change this? So if you, very famous example from Lotus, how Lotus leaf keep itself clean, it's really because of its nanoscale microscopic structure which doesn't, which is so bumpy, so rough, that it doesn't allow water and dirt to settle on it. And many textiles and paint companies have been inspired to use this to keep surfaces clean. And another type of clean is cleaning, keeping clean from bacteria. This is a Galapagos shark skin, which has a design. Again, there is shape and information, not a new material, which doesn't allow bacteria to found, find a foothold on the surface. So there is no strategy of killing the bacteria like we do with disinfectants and antibiotics, where in turn we create a stronger and stronger bacteria. Here, bacteria is just not allowed to settle on a surface. So this texture has been mimicked by a company called Sharklet to make coatings, to make films, thin films, which can be stuck on handrails, doorknobs, even medical devices, so that there is no bacteria and people are not falling ill you know, uh, picking up bacteria as they touch things. Yeah, what an opportunity post COVID. <laughs> and about managing waste, if you see, this is a simple soil web. And how this really behaves is that every time, let's say a tree branch falls on the ground, you will find in a few days some worms or fungi growing on it. These fungi might be eaten by some anthropods, the anthropods might be eaten by some birds, and one day the bird will die, become part of the soil again. <laughs> and nourish some other plant. So material is moving from a plant branch to a fungi's body, from a fungi body to a bird body one day, and back to the soil, because they are all made out of the same material. So material is moving in a closed loop. So this, an eco-industrial park was, uh, this is in Kuala which uses similar idea that there is a coal-fired power plant in the, in the heart of this eco-industrial park. It has many uh, byproducts like clinker, gypsum, and conventionally these are all considered waste because nobody knows what to do with them. But here they have placed geographically next companies which can use these byproducts effectively next door. So a pharmaceutical company it will use the excess tea. A 
a road making company which will use the clinker and creating these closed loops so that there is no such thing as a waste which has to be thrown away and on the left you see uh, an image of a carpet so this is a carpet company called interflow which has been using biomimicry for over a decade now to transform the way they do business and they use uh, nature's inspiration to not only redesign their carpet how they look but how they are made and they are actually put employing uh, fishermen who are out of jobs in indonesia to pull out all the uh, fish nets which were thrown in marine water to pick them up clean up the rc and supply it to them as a raw material so they are mining out of waste and not new virgin material to make their carpets so another idea that is uh, people have to start thinking about that how can we mine out of waste So if we do simple things like, not very simple, but we procure material, design, manufacture, maintain, and have an end, uh, manage the end of functional life of a product as nature does, uh, there is a chance we, we can create a world of abundance, sustainability as we desire, and yet meet all our needs. And this is a huge opportunity or a huge lost chance for india because in some ways when all the world the developed world has developed and they've run out of land only now we are undertaking smart cities and make in india so uh, do we want to become a europe of 20 years ago or here we have an opportunity to do things with hindsight and understanding what does our place our resources require so this is a challenge i think we will not lose this moment but I think all of you must be saying this is all theory. Is it working? So the good news is that we've been teaching biomimicry uh, for the last now nearly seven, eight years. And this is the only program to our knowledge which has been successfully taught across disciplines. While we are all saying we need multidisciplinary subjects, uh, this is a demonstration. So we have taught in more than 150 workshops. And this includes, call, you know, these are the kind of places we have taught so right from a fashion designer to a politician to a bcom student to a space engineer to children to children yeah it is because nature i'm sorry to say but nature gives a damn about engineering physics politics those are our imaginations nature is about pattern and phenomena everything is embedded and that's the kind of integrated thinking that now in today's world will really lead to true innovation uh, I, I don't want to sound uh, that, but I have met a lot of research scholars and they say that within a disciplinary domain, there is a lot of research fatigue. It's very difficult. So you have to learn how to do multidisciplinary research. But the question is, what is, what is the working format? This is already demonstrated. And uh, we want to just share with you a few student projects. And our workshops are very small. So we don't have the depth to fully do that. But the results have been phenomenal. So this was one uh, project by a student. Uh, it was just a, a two week workshop where he, they developed a filtration system uh, inspired by the kidney of a kangaroo rat. The kangaroo rat is one of creature which doesn't drink water during its lifetime. It gets all its water needs from its food. But for that very reason, any water that goes out of the system is a very expensive resource. So its kidney needs to be super efficient so that whatever is excreted uh, has minimum water molecules. So understanding the mechanism of the kidney, this student uh, uh, designed. But interestingly, this team, there is one biologist and four engineers working together. The biologists hated engineering and the engineers hated biology. And yet they ended up with a product, which is, I think they almost got a funding for it. So yeah. it is so, possible to do multidisciplinary. Yeah, so we have to be very realistic that often it takes <laughs> five, ten, or even one month just to get the team dynamics going. <laughs> Collaboration is the next step. <laughs> you know, uh, this was a project at NID students where they designed uh, gunny bags which are thrown, you know, during disaster relief, and often things get broken. And cell phone covers inspired by how a cat falls. And you know, cats generally land softly without breaking. Simple things, but uh, but these things, these ideas wouldn't have happened uh, without 
looking at nature. This is another very interesting project where somebody, the team came to us, they wanted to make biodegradable chip packaging. And when they looked at nature, they realized that our packaging is so dumb. Most of our packaging has an expiry date. And even though the food inside is good, just because of the date, 20% of our food is getting unnecessarily wasted. But if you look at nature, a banana doesn't lie. When it goes rotten, the color changes. So they realized, can we make our uh, packaging real time, sense and respond? And they and suddenly this gave a complete new possibility to, to designing of packaging. Uh, similarly, so I think this is also very interesting in biomimicry that you start with a functional problem, but the discoveries you made make you do things that you never thought of. So just by mere observation, a lot of insights happen, which I think is a very different from a usual scientific way of solving problems. Yeah, and the great thing is it's completely scientific because if somebody says, oh, this is out of the world, you say, no, no, this is part of our world and the evidence is in the banana or the evidence is in the... So the only thing is we don't know it. So go talk to a biologist. That's all that is required. Similarly, even social problems, we have people who've come up with design strategies for team management. So this was a group in NID who looked at teamwork. You know, these dogs in Africa are one of the most successful hunters, almost 80 to 85 percent. So how come they are so successful? And they were especially looking that in a team, often you don't do what was expected to do, so other people will sulk. Now in dogs, you can't sulk in a hunt. You know, if you sulk, you die. So, so how do how does the system readjust to these unexpected behaviors? A lot of these questions which we don't even think about, and then they suddenly lead to discovery of design principles which can make more resilient system. So we've also had amazing uh, things where actually our students taught us, and that's the most satisfying thing when you learn from your own student. And when we, you know, a group of students wanted to look at gender equality and we said, this is too difficult. And they actually looked at slime mold and other things, My neural serious. networks, My My yeah. and came up with strategies and we standed hum we stood humble, but our respect for nature grew that we are not the experts, nature is the expert. And these are just few things we want to show it to you so that because you should have a healthy doubt that, okay, it's nice to speak, but anything happening, we are overwhelmed by the possibilities of solutions that happen. But before we end, actually the most important thing we want to talk about, and which is often missed in our society, in our culture right now, is that biomimicry is more than just emulation. Whatever we talked about till now was emulation, which was giving you a technical solution, a technical solution which later on would have an economic outcome. Because that's, remember the earlier framework, that's the way we have designed our society. And that's the reason for its dysfunctionality. So in biomimicry, actually, our humble thing is that we have made a circle because, in fact, it's not our circle, our, our institute made it. But what it means is that you have to do three things together in equal importance. So these are ethos, emulate and reconnect. Emulate we've spoken about, which is copying from nature, the technical, the intellectual, the economic outcomes. Ethos is the ethic, create conditions conducive to life. It should be as important. And the third, which is least paid attention to, is reconnect. Reconnect is our emotional love and connection with nature, outside of all intellectual and economic jargon. Because if you don't love something, you are only pretending. You are only intellectually saying that I want to do it. So. If we do all three, then true biomimicry happens. And then we have a more balanced system. I would say we will have more balanced professionals. We will have more balanced society because we, we as beings have created a culture which is too focused on only one dimension. But there is a dimension to the purpose, to alignment. And to do that, we will probably have to look at our current ways of education and research. Biomimicry in application is actually tough because it involves multidisciplinary exploration. So we have to see how do we create the space where multidisciplinary professionals can work. And even putting multidisciplinary work professionals together and locking them in a room might not work. So we actually feel that a little bit of training in system integration skills and system thinking prepares people to start learning in multidisciplinary team. And the big shift is that from human-centered, we become life-centered. And uh, 
and let's get back to the covid pause the shunya so we are in a pause let's think metaphorically we have become a pupa given our tendencies we can very well go back to becoming fatter caterpillars or we can change we can restart and become restorative biomimicry gives us a chance to rise and you don't have to trust us don't take our word now let's go back and look at what everybody has been saying right from our spiritual leaders to scientific leaders if you really go back they've all been asking us to look at nature till 10 years ago i didn't know what it meant biomimicry gave me a way to understand what they mean i would welcome you to join this journey discover it on your own and for, like for every talk there has to be one big take away my request our request to you is if nothing just develop a new habit of the mind we have a habit of brushing our teeth and that's a simple habit for every big problem that you're solving at least have a question what would nature do here you might not have the answer and that's okay but not having the right question that's not okay so let's get this question in our vocabulary of of solution finding and answers will happen so we end this by humbly thanking all our teachers and our teachers include from cyanobacteria to fellow homo sapiens uh, so i think we've taken a little more time but if there are any questions we'll be happy to take them thank you so much sir for that great session i'm sure people have gotten deep insight of what really biomimicry is and they'll be imbibing those principles of biomimicry in their day to day life so now with this we'll open up with a short q and a session so anna do you have any questions hello uh, yeah uh, thank you sir and ma'am for that insightful session we got to learn many things and i actually hoped it went on for some more time with some more examples some more implications yeah we have got there in fact after every before every talk we struggle to pull out some and we want to show so many but you you guys give us only one hour so we have to decide we cannot show this we cannot show this it's yeah, very we, tough we have a two week credit <laughs> course uh, in the open electives at nid so uh, thank you sir for that information uh, sir we have got a few questions from uh, youtube from the audience uh, so johan kukreja he asked that uh, biomimicry is a very important principle but where should we start i mean the nature is massive there are things going on at micro to macro level so where should we start yeah that's what uh, johan has asked yeah johan uh, it's a very uh, very important uh, question so that's the reason where a structured subject of biomimicry was created and uh, of course in this one hour talk we couldn't take you through the methodology structure and tools so to simplify and make biomimicry applicable uh, two set of parameters have been created like you know we all we all know in our industrial way of life if you can't measure something it's very difficult to 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 manage it so certain metrics which are called life principles and although there are various institutes with various ideas where we have studied these are 26 measurable life principles uh, which give you the essence of the design principles with nearly all life on the planet follows so it's a good metric to see if there are there are gaps in your innovation in your process or your system so you can do a quick gap analysis so even if you are not able to close the gap you understand that this is possible and then there are deep principles which are context based so something which is relevant in antarctica might not be relevant in sahara but life principles are relevant across the board so these are two uh, tools or 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 theoretical frameworks which exists which can be taught and which should be taught in my view uh, which are available also there is a methodology just like in design thinking you have a methodology that how do you uh, identify that out of the 30 million species which are the few species which are relevant to your problem which we call you know integrating biology into design how do you integrate it how do you extract the design principles so these can be taught and we are hoping slowly this will become part of our education and practice cultures but to to answer your question another way 
today this is a, a subject which needs to be learned you know somehow it is not easy to look at nature and solve problems you need some tools and methods to get started and you do need a bit of training and practice uh, only then you can hone the skill because we are a generation which has grown up grown up quite cut off from the natural world and we really don't know how to navigate the natural world so yes you do need to train yourself in the subject yeah also the kind of databases uh, re required are only now beginning to get uh, built uh, a lot of biological literature is being translated into design principles so hopefully in the coming few years there will be a lot more available uh, already there is much uh yes it's true people don't know that these databases are now beginning to become available so we can share with you there's one database called asknature.org which is freely available and uh, an engineer or a business person or just a normal person can ask a functional question to biology that you don't have to uh, learn the latin names and things you can ask how does nature adhere in a waterproof environment and get a technical answer to that so this is work in progress and there's another database if you just walk out into your garden yeah. or some natural setting just observe and ask questions like how does nature sticking to something how is nature storing water how is nature managing water so i think that is another skill which we say reconnect connect back to nature and a lot of things are done purely by observation thank you ma'am so the answer lies in nature that's just some <laughs> uh, uh ma'am uh, i have a question from my side like uh, we have been uh, studying in a particular education system where uh, engineering and medical i mean biology and non biology students were segregated since uh, class 11 12 so like that void has already been there like okay. seeded in our system so uh, how do you feel that uh, we can you know eradicate this void and uh, bring people from two back backgrounds together like while doing engineering or yeah the other way around well uh, it's not very difficult uh, and it is very difficult depend on on the will uh, will to so the simple thing is introduce it right from k12 level and there is a slight conflict of interest might be but i want to just disclaim we have been for the last two years trying to pitch for funding because we want to develop modules from k12 uh, as well as other modules where uh, where children right from the beginning are not seeing nature as outside of physics chemistry and biology where they are seeing nature as part of physics chemistry and biology so if right from the beginning you are taught that okay calculus is also happening or a horse to tail grass is actually in logarithmic ratios so you don't grow up uh, you know disconnected you understand that it's your body is explained by physics chemistry uh, so so these so are I, things i think the problem is because the way we are taught biology in in at least the indian system it is all about nature so it is latin names it is very descriptive whereas in biomimicry you don't look it's okay not to know the name of the plant but we need to know how is it functioning so you you need to know from nature and not just about nature and that is the big gap so it's not so i think if an engineer is actually taught how is a cactus managing water he will be far more interested because you have that kind of a mindset then you know i tell you the uh, the latin name of the cactus and where it grows and how big it is yeah, a lot of us ran away from biology because <laughs> it was taught like that <laughs> so i think the the minute we see that shift people are very interested i mean when we teach school kids they say if biology is taught to me like this it will be my favorite subject you know so actually in our mind there is not a big gap it is just the way we have translated biology we have made it very very inaccessible to people who don't know latin so well i mean it is tough <laughs> yes sir yeah yes ma'am uh, there's one question uh, any books that we can read particularly on biomimicry 
or like any uh, colleges offering courses on biomimicry. So I think the courses part you have already discussed about National Institute of Design. So if you can mention some books, good. No, actually we do uh, workshops from three hours to four months uh, electives in various colleges, not just NID. Uh, so we do it in architecture schools. We do it in many design schools, engineering colleges. Um, and even schools. So our workshops are right now outside of any one institute. We do it wherever anybody's interested. And we also do open workshops, which we just open it up on our website and anybody can sign up and learn biomimicry because we see a lot of interest even for, from working professionals. So that is one part of the question. Um, Regarding the book, I think a good yeah. book for everybody is to start with uh, the, a book called Biomimicry, Technology is Inspired by Nature. Uh, the name might be a little different by Janine Benias. Innovations Inspired. Innovations Inspired by Nature. It's a good starting book. And uh, I think many books will happen. My personal view is that as against the current way of thinking where all information is contained inside a book, physics, biomimicry probably might never be like that because it's, it's a living subject as you grow uh, and i think we should keep that spirit of seeking alive so uh, a lot of work needs to be done there are many people who've done biomimetic engineering in a very uh, specific way uh, my humble view is that a holistic way of learning where books have to be written maybe one of you will write the, those books uh, but I think we need to reconsider that either it's too intellectually focused. If you're talking about the tongue of a lizard, then it's just that. Or So those kind of books exist. But true biomimicry, I think Janine's book is a good starter. Uh, we will keep you posted, you know, if, if there is some forum if, as we find more material. But just if you are very focused on certain kind of topics, like for mechanical engineers, there's a book called Cats, Paws and Catapults which has been written by uh, with only mechanical engineering in mind that how nature's mechanical uh, mechanics work compared to this. Then there is a science writer called Philip Ball who studies shapes and forms and patterns in nature. So it depends on your interest. There are books written on biomimicry and architecture uh, for civil engineers that might be of great interest. So, but yes, the, the, the book that is very holistic is Janine's book, uh, Biomimicry Innovation Inspired by Nature. Okay, so I have a question, like what are the challenges in India, current challenges to adopt biomimicry compared to abroad? Because here very few universities are working on that field. Yeah, I think to be very honest with you, I think uh, most of the developed countries where thing, the initial funding and support comes from government and grants. Uh, that ecosystem in India we found is difficult. I mean, we've been eight years, we have basically used our own resources. You know, uh, We've actually paid to promote the subject out of our own personal savings, uh, which is all right. But beyond a point, uh, you know, uh, certain things need, like even a seed, initially has to use its own, uh, you know, it needs certain nutrition. So I think we need to, we need to get out of the colonized mentality that we will only become distributors of Western knowledge. Uh, we should have the courage to invest in our people and say that, okay, create your own knowledge. Uh, I think eight years we struggled just uh, promoting this idea. Uh, you know, making people aware of this idea that you can look at nature in a different way. And uh, in eight years, we've never had a class or a workshop where people didn't agree with us. You know, after they found out, they did not agree that this is a good way to innovate and to innovate in a very sustainable way. Uh, so I think firstly, I think a lot of people are not informed about this idea. And then they don't know how to practice it. So that needs a bit of training, like somebody even in, your, in our forum here asked a question, how do I go about it? So there is where institutes need to invest in this and you know incorporate this as a subject. You know, we should be taught how to look at nature while we are looking at other human innovations. Uh, 
but that investment is not coming probably at a rate which yeah. would be healthier maybe a policy decision might be better that it's made a foundational course in all engineering colleges uh, or maybe or at least the intent needs to be expressed that maybe we are going to invest so that in two years you would have developed the content so those first steps i am hoping uh, will happen now because you know we are in shunya this is the time to think and reset so maybe you will amplify our voice and maybe we'll uh... and institutional structures in india are i think very tough to uh, break or you know to enter and say here is a new subject you know people are very skeptical they don't know how to introduce something new in a curriculum so that is another challenge in india okay so thank you so much sir and ma'am for that interactive session we we really enjoyed interacting with you so looking forward to you have you in person at iit madras campus sometime in future so with this we will like to end and is there something like for our audience to connect with you or something yeah our email address i don't know if you can if, if we can quickly so biomimicry india at the rate gmail.com it's pretty simple is our email address our website address is biomimicryindia.com uh, please feel free to write to us uh, we had also started a biomimicry india network kind of thing we felt that in 2021 knowledge can be created in a collaborative way so we have a facebook page we don't want to promote facebook but that's the only platform we have uh, feel free to join that network and uh, interestingly often people give a question we don't even know the answer and somebody from you know some scientist from israel or somebody will answer it so these are new ways we are discovering where knowledge can be created and shared uh, so these are our two contact ways biomimicry india at the rate gmail.com and biomimicry india.com we would love to hear from you and we would love to come to chennai because uh, we have lived in chennai for 3 years and we love coming there so okay. <laughs> yes sir thank you ma'am yeah okay okay uh, anurag uh, yeah okay so with this we would like to end up this session and we have other sessions also so do check them on the iit madras rsd website so thank you sir and ma'am once again for joining us on sunday <laughs> thank you thank you best of luck thank you thank you for having us yeah. thank you for having us
Thank you, Arnav. A very good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I welcome you to the next session of the Research Scholar Day 2021, the annual research festival of IIT Madras. It gives me great pleasure and honor to welcome our speaker of the session, Dr. Aris Pichai and Abhishek Chopra. Welcome, sir. Abhishek Chopra, founder and chief executive officer, he is currently a PhD student at Reiser Polytechnic Institute USA, pursuing aerospace engineering, and his research specialization is developing high fidelity and parallel computational fluid dynamics code for rotorcraft applications. He has several technical publications, including journal and conference paper under his name. At BQP, he focused on the holistic growth of each aspects of the startup from business marketing and technical team. He also leads the quantum computing team at BQP. The second speaker of the day, Dr. Arish Pichai, the quantum scientist. He is currently a professor at Christ University, Bangalore. He obtained his director, uh, PhD in quantum computing from the NIT Tree Chi, India. He worked as an associate consultant and R&D. Uh, he's working at R&D at Atos Pune. His research interests include quantum computing, game theory, artificial intelligence, and algorithm. He has published several research paper in referred international journal and international conference at BQP. He is monitoring the quantum team in research and development. He brings a wealth of knowledge as well as the established in academic industry partnership. I welcome you both, sir, on the board. Over to you, sir. Hello. Can everyone hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, cool. So let me just share my screen. Um, so first of all, thank you everyone. Uh, thank you for making uh, IIT Bombay uh, or sorry, IIT Madras to welcome us. Um, it's a great pleasure that we we are here to represent Boson Q Sai. Um, quick in, quick introduction. Uh, Today we are going to talk about uh, some of the aspects of multiphysics uh, simulation, uh, which is part of like boson Q size main mission. Then we will talk about the need for quantum computing, then uh, some introduction about uh, quantum computing, and then how boson Q size leveraging the power of quantum computing. Uh, we also at the end of the uh, session will have some opportunity for the audience to see what's going on in Bo boson Q size and how can they become part of this amazing startup. So before that, uh, let's start with the introduction of speaker. So here, um, I'll go ahead with my introduction. So we have a uh, four member uh, founding team, myself, Abhishek Chopra, I'm the founder and CEO of Boson Q Sai. Uh, I'm currently a PhD candidate at Rensselaer Polytech Institute, uh, where I'm pursuing aerospace engineering. I develop high fidelity, um, CPU, GPU based computational fluid, fluid dynamics tool um, with the rotor graph application. And before that, I finished my bachelor's in aerospace engineering at Rutgers University, uh, where I met uh, Ruth and Hassan. Um, also, this is this is my academic side of things, but at Boson QSI, it has been a great journey so far. We started in September 2020 and we have gained a um, great amount of interest. Um, in an idea and the product that we are currently developing, uh, we consider uh, this as a as a leading Indian startup, which was recently also published by the Analytical Magazine. But what what goes on behind is something that we work tirelessly um, day in day out, um, and believing in this idea, which is actually quite challenging, and how challenging that will be cleared in for the most like. Um, and we are still growing and we want to be the, the representation from um, India at a global stage. So quickly introducing um, uh, other members, Ruth Langsola is the CTO, uh, Hassan Azmat is the Chief Business Officer, and then Josh Minocha is the Chief Commercial Officer. Uh, the current academic uh, you can see uh, down below. Um, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Pichai if you can uh, introduce himself 
um, and then I will introduce the rest of the advisory board. Um, thank you, Abhishek, uh, for giving this opportunity. Uh, I am uh, Arish Pichai, who is interested in quantum computing like before uh, it was commercially famous. So I started my PhD around uh, seven, eight years back, and uh, that uh, this field impressed me very well. And I continued as uh, after finishing my P PhD, I uh, started working as a quantum associate consultant in a company in a quantum R and D. Then uh, right now, uh, the spirit of uh, Boson QSI made me uh, stay in them and to guide them through their uh, expedition. Yeah. Thank you, Abhishek. Thank you, Dr. Pichai. So yeah, along with Dr. Pichai, we have uh, Dr. Chenna Kadapa, who is the multiphysics lead. He is currently a professor at University of Bolton in UK. And then we have this amazing experience advisory board, which helps us both uh, like all from technical business, uh, operational and managerial side of things. So recently, um, with the likes of uh, Mr. Vijay Sethi, um, who is the ex-CIO of Hero Motor Corp, joined our board. And then we have uh, Mr. Ashish Kare, who joined us uh, earlier this year, along with uh, Mr. Satish Bordu. Uh, Mr. Alex Khan, who is a very well known person working with many, uh, has worked with many quantum startups before, um, and is also part of uh, Harrisburg University in the US, has, uh, has also recently uh, came into both on his ISG quantum advisor. Okay, so that being said, now let's go into the exciting stuff, um, which is basically who we are. So Boson QSI is the first mover in this emerging deep tech space of quantum computing, this disruptive technology that is taking a lot of interest. But we are coming from a very different perspective that we are applying this for multiphysics simulation. And in a slide, I will explain what multiphysics simulation is. Uh, we are an enterprise level technology. So basically a B2B, uh, we are only targeting those high level um, engineering companies. So for example, when I talk about multiphysics, people ask where, like you see ANSYS, Altair, and these are like very student level, how does this become a B2B technology? So in that case, think about multiphysics simulation being applied from anywhere, like designing a building, a bridge, to manufacturing a car or an aeroplane, to even going analyzing the blood flow in your body. Everything between that whole realm can be put into multiphysics simulation. So for us, we are looking at those highly engineering companies, like car companies, bike companies, aerospace companies, construction, manufacturing companies, who utilize this as a tool. And the, the interesting part that we are bringing on the table, other than quantum computing, is that uh, we are a SaaS-based company. So everything to do with us has to be like you just need a good internet, not even a good local machine, which many traditional softwares require. So for those who do not um, know or have a background, I would like to help them to understand what multiphysics simulation is. So multiphysics simulation, as I mentioned, is an important part of any kind of engineering design or analysis. So for example, let's say I start my own um, uh, let's say Tesla, um, and I want to design or manufacture a new electric vehicle car. So first, what I do is basically, first I design the outer aerodynamics of the body. And for that, I do fluid dynamic simulation. Then the second important thing is safety of passenger. So we do some kind of crash analysis and all that. On that, we need structural mechanics simulations. Then there is the HVAC part um, inside the car, how the thermal will flow, the batteries now, everything, how will this whole thing happen? That's where we do thermal simulation. Then with autonomous and electric vehicle car, signal processing becomes very, very crucial. And that's where we have electromagnetic simulation. Now the heart of the electric vehicle car, the battery themselves, requires extensive amount of analysis, which is done through electrochemistry. And last but not the least, the user comfort that they do not hear noise and everything. That is where acoustic simulations come into picture. So now I gave you a high level idea about what multiphysics is. 
uh, these things can be studied individually or together. Doing it together is a very complex task and requires very thorough analysis, but a lot of computational power. But also each of these physics require high accuracy, especially when they are interlinked with each other or even when they are doing individually. So that is where the need of quantum computing will come into picture. So let me take an example. So here what you see on the right hand side, um, this is basically telling you why we need high accuracy. So first we have the experiments. Uh, so this is basically think about of a jet coming out of a pipe, uh, a, a very fast paced jet. Um, this is something that you see similar in your combustion process inside like your engine. So in the experiments, as you see, as time evolves, the things go below and below. And then the traditional softwares actually use this center thing, like center tool, corner rands in this case. It's low accuracy. And you can see how far this is apart. It, it can capture mean um, things very well, mean quantities, but not the transients. And that is where the right hand side LES, which is the high accuracy simulation, can play a role. So now you can see the difference between low accuracy and high accuracy and how, how much high accuracy is close to the real world. And that is where you need highly accurate simulation. Now here in this example, this was actually carried by my PhD group. This was basically a tail of an aircraft where we were under, trying to understand the flow behind the tail of an aircraft. You see the level of details. This was done using the same tool that is on the rightmost of the right picture, the LES. But this simulation took 3 million parallel processors. So for those who don't understand the supercomputing language, 3 million parallel processors, meaning 3 million computers running all together at the same time. But even with that much computation power, it took about 5 to 6 months to finish this simulation. So you can see how humongous this simulations can get. Um, and this is, mind you, this is just one part of an aircraft. If you, let's say, want to do full aircraft simulation or even full car simulation, it takes months and years. And especially for engineering companies, they do not have that kind of time. That is why they resort to something of like the center line uh, thing, like the ranks, what I showed in the right hand side image. So where we come into picture is that we believe that we need more computational power more computational power to do more better simulation. Um, but but now, I will tell you why that is not possible. So multiphysics simulation needs a lot of computational power, as I stated in last slide, meaning that it needs more processing power. One way to do that is do, like getting bigger supercomputers. That's what the world is currently doing. We are moving from theta scale to exascale. I have worked in an exascale or started to work in exascale machines uh, in my PhD. But this trend cannot continue because by 2030, we will have zeta scale supercomputers that will require immense amount of electricity. That is 80 megawatts for one supercomputer. To put, to, put, to put things into perspective, 80 megawatts meaning four times the daily electricity consumption of Mumbai. That's immense. We just cannot spend that much amount of electricity to run just one supercomputer. So what's the other solution? The other solution is to pack more transistors in a chip. Yes, that's that's what Moore's law says. Many people say the Moore's law is broken or it doesn't follow anymore. And, and I will leave those things to Dr. Pichai when he describes his stuff. But what I understand is that they have reached atomic scales where the laws of quantum physics have started to apply. Meaning that you cannot go with traditional, like you cannot just go, like decrease the size of the transistor and hope that everything remains the same once it reaches the atomic scale. So there is definitely an engineering challenge that comes. So this solution won't work. And that is where the solution of quantum computer works. So quantum computers work in an entirely different paradigm. That is why it is a and the reason why it is said a uh, disruptive technology is because it is much more powerful than classical computer. In an ideal case scenario, it can be 100 million times 
faster than a classical computer or even a supercomputer. So now I will let uh, Dr. Bachai continue from here on, and I will be back uh, for the further slide after he explains and gives you guys a bit of background on quantum computing. Uh, thank you, Abhishek. Thank you for the introduction to multivisit simulation and the need for quantum computers. So I, I really feel privileged to explain the power of quantum computer now. Let, let's uh, go back uh, to the history of computers. Our first computer. Our first, first computer was uh, uh, like, uh, it was very small. Like this, in a room, small in the sense. For them, it was small, not for us. Uh, it, it's like uh, I used an ironical word here. It was of a size of a room, which is 30 cross 50 foot. So it was uh, invented uh, and started being used uh, during the era of 1946 to 1959. The first computer consisted of vac vacuum tubes. You, you, you should imagine that it has around 17,468 vacuum tubes. And it also had 70,000 resistors. And the capacity of the computer is to add numbers it has 1,000, 10,000 cap uh, capacitors and it, it can add 5,000 numbers in one second. That was the highest speed achieved. But think of a bigger computer in a room which can do just 5,000 number addition in one second. That was not enough for us to do computations because we have uh, many complex scientific problems to be solved and this speed is not enough for people to solve those problems. So there came a development. So, like in the, like uh, researchers started uh, keep on uh, making computer faster as well as smaller so then came the invention of transistors then transistors became ICs and ICs now microprocessors and where is it going to end we, we have different generations of computers we, we used to call the first generation computers are the one which used vacuum tubes. Second generation computers are the one which use transistors and then ICs, then microprocessors. So what is the end of this? Where is it going to end? So this drastic change in the, uh, in the speed as well as the size of the computers or the chips was absorbed by Gordon Moore. So every com quantum computer uh, talk uh, will be incomplete without mentioning his name. Gordon Moore is a co-founder of Intel. And he observed from 1965, he observed that every two years or approximately every 18 months, the number of transistors being uh, put in a chip or uh, fabricated in a chip is getting double. So he was wondering and he, he wrote a paper on it and that became Moore's law. And that worked. That worked till 20, uh, 2020. So nearly it, it, it started slowing down. This Moose law was working from 1965, but recently uh, at the end of uh, 2020, like, it started slowing down and people started doubting whether we can, that this Moose law is going to work in the future also. Because when you go down, when you increase the number of transistors to increase the speed, you have to decrease the size. And either you, you should decrease the size or you should go for layer. In both the technology, the problem is limitation of size. Because we want the computer to be as small as possible. Because if it is a bigger one, then we will have energy dissipation. Again, achieving the efficiency will be a problem for us. So what happens if the size keep on decreases, then by 2030, we have to use atoms as our transistors. Will that solve the problem? Answer is no. Even in July 2020, a single atom transistor of size 2 nanometer was um, uh, tested in Hebrew University, Jerusalem. That was the smallest tra transistor tested ever. But the problem with atomical size is bigger. Okay, let's see how the efficiency transformed from 1971. This is the first uh, Intel uh, chip with 2,250 transistor. 
which is of uh, size 10 into 10 power minus 6 meter and the speed is 740 kilohertz and very recent faster chip or uh, processor is amd epic row which has 39.5 billion transistors each of size 7 into 10 power 9 meter and the speed is 3.4 gigahertz in the past uh, 30 years the speed became 3500 times faster and the size became 1000 times smaller is it going to happen in future also what happens in future if we have to increase the speed and decrease the size parallelly because performance is inversely proportional to size so and shorter the distance faster will be the travel of in information processing is nothing but transfer of bits inside the pro processor so shorter the distance will improve the efficiency so putting a lot of transistors and making the system bigger will not increase the efficiency so we have to reduce the size of the transistor to increase the efficiency but the problem is energy dissipation at one point the system will not behave as expected so if you keep on reducing the size what happens is you have to reach atomic or subatomic level where computers will not behave as expected subatomic level is not governed by newton's law so the computers cannot become smaller anymore and atom follows quantum mechanics this gave birth to the quantum computing era now we are in quantum computing era like i was waiting for this era for a long time since my phd I was like when i started my phd people used to uh, give pessimistic statement they used to say that this is not going to come this is not going to be a future but people like us like minded people who are interested in quantum computing survived survive and we are seeing the quantum era we are really happy to see the quantum era uh, the quantum era is necessary because the speed we achieved in the last 30 years using classical computer is not going to happen in another 30 years in the next 30 years we can predict we predicted that it is possible to achieve only 50 fold increase in speed using classical computer so we need an alternative and Moore's law is almost dead and we need an alternative that alternative is nothing but quantum computing i know most of you uh, heard about this uh, word quantum computing so i'll take you to the nuts and bolts of it so so, so, so that like it will not be a fancy word anymore for you so quantum computing started like uh, when people started thinking light is a wave sorry i happen to earlier people thought the physicists thought that light is a wave then uh, physicists discovered that like uh, using young's double slit experiment and more they discovered that light also behaves as a particle not only light all the subatomic particles they have duality uh, property in them so how to harness this duality property and what is the counterintuitive effects of duality property so the, the world subatomic particle world is term completely different it has because of this duality uh, property it has two specific or to uh, gift, gifted properties like uh, superposition and number two is entanglement. The slide is not getting transferred. Okay, yeah. There is a delay in the response. Sorry for this delay. Okay. One is superposition and another is quantum entanglement. Superposition can be thought of being at multiple places in the same thing or or if i want to measure a particle it can have multiple results at the same time like 
before measuring a position of a particle the position is not determined by a single number before measuring a particle the position cannot be determined by a single number but with the probability i i'm i'm uh, assuming that some of the audience do not know about physics just uh, i want to uh, make it clear for all the audience here so let me say that if i ask you a question like if i ask a student if i let let's assume that i'm a professor in iit madras and i call uh, the class rep and i ask him where are you his answer will be either in college or in hostel or uh, in the cafeteria or in the library i like uh, iit madras library very much i've been to that library many times so the answer from the student will be one place but if i call a subatomic particle and ask the answer will be like if you want me to find you will have probabilities of my position like 10 percentage probability of my me to be in the classroom 50 percentage of probability of finding me in the hostel and 40 percentage of probability or 40 percentage probability of finding me in the cafeteria so the position of a subatomic particle can be given using probability like you you will think how can a person be in multiple place at the same time because of the wave particle duality it spreads its position as a wave as a wave or it specifically speaking we call it as a probability amplitude the wave is nothing but probability amplitude you uh, using the wave function we can get the probability amplitude but when i want to see you personally you you, you will not show the probability and you will uh, stand in front of me to to be more clear i'll say like if i have a electron inside a, inside a box okay and i am asking you where inside the box box the electron is staying you cannot give the position of the electron until you take a microscope and electronic uh, like a microscope to view the electron when you view the electron the position collapses the superposition character uh, property collapses and it, it comes down to a single place but when you don't view the electron it spreads itself throughout the box this is what uh, einstein was uh, worried about he he never uh, uh, supported this quantum computing so now let's come to quantum entanglement which is another interesting property of quantum subatomic particles entanglement is nothing but when two particles or correlated with each other when when we establish a relationship between two electrons or two subatomic particles then we take them far apart a change in one particle will get reflected in another this is something like uh, you might have experienced in your life like uh, suddenly you oh, like this this everyone must have experiences okay suddenly one day Uh, you will think of a friend to whom you have went contacted for a long time and when you think on that day you will get a call from him. maybe after months or after years this has happened to everyone here, like including me this is very similar to quantum entanglement when i make a relationship between two particles and then i keep them uh, apart like you can imagine the distance like one in uh, uh, earth and another in mars still change of change made in one electron will get reflected in the other very recently uh, using this entanglement our isro uh, uh, showed showcased a free space quantum communication in 300 meter distance it happened very recently i, I guess it is last month or last a couple of weeks back. so these are all the special qualities of uh, subatomic particles which we are going to make use to increase the efficiency of algorithms so to harness the superposition there are uh, different mathematicians 
and especially the mathematician called Deutsch. He's a physicist, actually. He's an American phys British physicist, and uh, uh, Joshua, an uh, American mathematician. Both of them developed an algorithm called Deutsch Joshua algorithm, which was capable of solving, which which solves a function with multiple values simultaneously. See, in a classical computer, if I want to get uh, f of x for n numbers, I have to do it for n times. n steps will solve the problem. But in a quantum computer, one single query to the quantum computer is capable of giving n answers. It holds the n answers in it. So when you harness the power of entanglement, you have this uh, amazing uh, algorithm called super dense coding. So let's consider that uh, there are uh, two people, uh, Alice and Bob, they want to communicate to each other. They have one of the entangled particle, each of them have one of them. So like we are making a relationship between the two particles and giving one to Bob and another to Alice. And this super dense coding makes use of the quantum gates and it finally gives the output like if Bob wants to communicate to allies without any contact. Okay, Bob is not going to contact allies uh, in person. The change made in one particle will get reflected in allies and she can read what he is sending. This, is, this algorithm uh, is called super dense coding. So these are all some of interesting algorithms. Just I've shown a couple of them. One is uh, solving uh, uh, f of x and another is super dense coding. Give me a second. I'm getting a delay in next slide. Uh, Abhishek, I'm experiencing a bit delay in changing the slides. Can you move it for me? This is fine now. Abhishek, I'll handle this. If I face any delay, I'll need your assistance to change the slides. Yeah, thank you. So how this happens, how this superposition happens and how this entanglement happens, everything starts by taking a subatomic particle. So let me give a very simple example of how a quantum computer makes use of an atom to store values or data and do the processing. Okay, Let's take a simple atom which has uh, electrons in it and everybody knows that the first uh, orbit is called the ground state and the next one is called the excited state. So in a classical computer we have on or off. That is either there will be a voltage inside the flip-flop, actually classical computer uses flip-flops or registers. A group of flip-flops is called registers where when I send a, a voltage, it is on. And when in the absence of voltage, it is called off. And to make changes in this uh, voltage, we use gates. A similar construct is there in quantum computing. In quantum computing, we used to call ground state as off and excited status on. When an electron is in ground state, we call it as zero. And when an electron is in excited state, we call it as one. And we use math, completely linear algebra to represent everything. Every quantum algorithm is nothing but matrix multiplications. Most of them are matrix multiplications. And we denote every state of an electron using matrices. So this state of electron is denoted with this matrix, one and zero. Means when I have a one in the off position, it means the system is off. When I have a one in the on position, which means the system is on. Actually, it is a column vector, but for simplicity and for easy recognition, I have used a row vector. You, you imagine this is a column vector. And the gate that we are going to use is energy here. When I give energy to this ground state, the electron gets excited and I will get this answer. When I give, when I remove the energy, I can make the electron move from the 
excited state to ground state. This is how a quantum computer works with information or data. And classically, we have many gates like AND gate, OR gate, XOR gate. This is a very famous gate in uh, uh, classical computer. This is called XOR gate. This is very similar to our two-way switch. This XOR gate will give one as an output only when one of the inputs is one. See, when the input is 0, 0, the output will be 0. When the input is 1, 1, the output will be 0. The input 0, 1 or 1, 0 will give me an output 1. We have a similar classical uh, quantum uh, gate called quantum XOR or C0, controlled NOT gate. What it does is it has a control qubit. When the control qubit is 1, the target qubit, we have two qubits, okay. In, in, in C0 gate, there will be two inputs. Like we have two inputs in the classical gate, we have two inputs for the quantum C0 gate. It takes the two input and the target qubit, that is the B, will be changed based on the value of the A, that is the control qubit. This is very, very similar to our classic law. Look at this, 0, 0 will give 0, 1, 1 will give 1, 0. The same way it happens in C0 also. So we, this shows us that the classical computer can also be mimicked using quantum computer. Quantum computer is not only capable of working on superpositions and entanglements, it is capable of working as a classic. It is an all-rounder. And uh, I would like to uh, introduce an algorithm called Shor's algorithm, which is a very, very famous one, which uh, actually paved way to a new research area called quantum post-quantum cryptography. What uh, Shor's algorithm does is, Shor's algorithm is capable of factoring any number in polynomial time. Factoring a number, an integer is what important in decrypting or, or breaking encryptions. So when, when there is a invention of Shor's algorithm, the cryptographic researchers started thinking like they should start developing classical encryption system, which is quantum proof, which is quantum resistant. So this uh, gave rise to a new uh, research field called post-quantum cryptography. And uh, there are very famous um, simulation platforms available to test these algorithms. And then came our Groover search. This is another famous algorithm which searches an element in a set of unsorted array. So let's imagine if I have a thousand elements and I have to search and uh, a number in that thousand numbers. Then the worst case is order of thousand. I have to pick up all the thousand elements. That's the worst case. But Groover search does this in root of n time. This is not an exponential speed up, but still the speed up will uh, is very significant. So then came many algorithms which proved the supremacy of quantum computers. And Groover search does it. If you wonder how it does, it, it just plays with the probability amplitudes of the subatomic particles to get the solution. And now a very uh, famous algorithm in uh, the research in uh, under research and under development on and uh, there are some machine learning algorithms which are doing very good job in the field of quantum computing. And people started thinking of combining quantum computer as well as classical computer to get better speed up. And we, the, those algorithms are called hybrid quantum algorithms. And this is the present state of, uh, present promising state of quantum computers and algorithms. And the qubits achieved this, right? Like till now we have seen the algorithm or software point of quantum computing. Now uh, this picture will show you the hardware development in quantum computing. Also earlier people thought it is very difficult to implement a quantum computer. People used to say that 
it needs very high engineering because to make a subatomic particle behave like 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 as you expect you have to take that subatomic particle to seizing temperature that is 0 kelvin 0 kelvin is nothing but minus 273 degree centigrade which is uh, which needs high cost and high engineering technology so this made people think pessimistically that uh, achieving a quantum computer physically is not possible maybe mathematically you can develop quantum algorithms but you won't have a machine to implement it but we have achieved around 1000 qubit by ibm 5000 qubit by uh, honeywell rigetti atos and many more companies so i hope i convinced and i made you guys realize that we are going to use quantum computers in near future and your kids are going to play with quantum computers and that's our dream and over to abhishek now Hello. Okay. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Pichai, for that uh, introduction. I, as Dr. Pichai said, I hope that we are able to convince people uh, that quantum is the next computing technology. Uh, not and and one thing I would like to say that this is something that has not to be thought that it will replace quant uh, like classical computers. I mean that is really not possible until next twenty to thirty years. But yes, the most computationally heavy tasks can be performed in quantum computing, which are not possible in classical computer. So uh, moving on with the presentation, this is what my next slide says: that uh, if you look at quantum technology, both from the software and the hardware side, we are currently in low uh, TRL region, whereas TRL meaning technology readiness level, but people have started and especially like these big giants on the right hand side have started to invest millions and billions of dollars right now every country in this world top like technology country which includes uh, us china uh, france germany canada including india who's investing 1.2 billion dollars um, in quantum technology for next 5 to 10 years because they see that trend to go down uh, we need lot of engineering challenges both from the hardware and software side so one such mission boson kisai has taken is that uh, the, on the software front of things we are developing our own algorithm some of the approaches we have started to take is what dr pichal showed in part two slides back um, the hybrid algorithm the quantum machine algorithms the um, the quantum inspired algorithm so we we are doing fair bit of research um, on that but it is this hybrid being hybrid is what is the the new key right now it it sort of happened with the cars also that there were purely like diesel petrol engine cars and then people moved to hybrid cars and now people are shifting to electric cars something similar is what we are doing we don't want to overwhelm our users with, with such technology So the vision that Boson QSI brings in is that we want to be the premier multi-physics simulation software company, leveraging the power of quantum computing. And our mission is to make multi-physics simulation a major application area for quantum computing. This is because we see quantum computing in such an in such an interesting field, but the applications are like related to AI, ML, some like. optimization problems but not really multi physics simulation which has been the key driver for high performance computing and data and we are the front runners and we want to continue being the front runners for multi physics simulations in quantum computing so the solution that we uh, we are developing currently is um, a state of an art saas based multi physics simulation software that is based on hybrid gpu qpu approach so multi physics in general has this community has been a bit behind on computing technology um these most of the softwares and the codes actually run on cpus and not even gpus which is the current trend that is going on every hardware provider like intel amd and all they produce only gpu 95% of their supercomputers are gpus and 5% computing power is cpu for some task 
So uh, that being said, uh, again, we are not a quantum computing company per se. We are a multi-physics simulation software company who's leveraging the power of quantum computing. We have a division on, on quantum computing. We have people um, and in a few slides I'm going to tell about the opportunities that currently exist at B2B in, in that regime. So, so that is where we come from. Now, some more exciting part. So the product that actually we are building and bringing to the market, which is still a bit far, um, is called BQ5. It's a SaaS offering, SaaS being a very major thing. So for a user who wants to access this massive technology of quantum computing that you see, like how quantum computers do, you can actually do that through your laptop itself. We will give you that access. So what you just need is a good internet connection, and then you are a user. If people in the audience they have used multi-physics simulations before, you need CAD, you need meshing, and all that. So these are some of the tools that we provide over the cloud. And it's that solver part is what we are redesigning, rethinking, and re-engineering where we put this hybrid GPU QPU approach. And then once you get that, you have the results. But the, the important part to note that. This whole process is quickened because we are using quantum computer. That's that's what we are saying uh, or stating. Currently, we have submitted one uh, patent over this thing, and there are multiple patents in the pipeline. But I'm just going to discuss this very briefly. One of the results. So um, we took the classical uh, approach, the classical algorithm given in the blue line, um, and and what we did then was this red line which was our hybrid classical quantum algorithm we put it in two different sizes size problem of 32 and size problem of 64 um, and uh, what we were able to see that there is a difference again these are theoretical results but this is what we have observed that there is a difference in the size 32 problem the difference is not that much not that significant but when you go to a bigger problem size, 64, uh, we see that speed up. And that is what we showed as part of our proof of concept. And we say that we can achieve exponential speed up with higher and higher problems. So high, the bigger the problem size, the more, much more the speed up is with this hybrid GPU QPU approach. Um, now we are currently looking towards, so we are a purely software company and we use hardware from other people. Who are making this hardware so ibm brigade qci um, all come under the architecture that we are currently working for or working towards i should say and the biggest thing that we are keeping in mind is scalability of our technology that meaning as dr Pichai was saying right now we have small qubit system two years from now we will have bigger then bigger and then bigger so here we have the timeline of uh, uh, ibm in 2019 they had some qubits i think so and then they have plans till 2023 to go above thousand qubits and we say that our technology will be uh, adaptable to this curve so the more you give the qubit the better our technology will be able to do and, and, and adapt to that so many people will, will be wondering how can you introduce quantum computing and not make it complicated so well here is the answer what you see here is a again for the purpose of this presentation it's a confidential uh, information uh, but i'm happy to share here with, with the audience so that they have a better understanding um, basically well, we have this gui where a, a multi-physics user comes and does everything so you can do modeling setup mesh simulation and then you see the results everything is in the SaaS server and in the back end is where we have the whole quantum computing going on. So for users, what does it mean? Negligible training cost. So if someone is well versed with multiphysics, they do not need anything else. They can just basically take our uh, software out, uh, out of the shelf and just start running it because of its nice user friendly GUI and drag and drop features. So that's about boson to size activities on the product side. Um, many people will be wondering where are the applications, the real world application this can be applied. So I gave you an example of automotive and aerospace, but actually multiphysics is an important tool in biotech, petroleum, renewable energy, astrophysics, and manufacturing. This together makes it a humongous uh, 
area, a market which we are trying to cater towards, but only for high accuracy simulation. I showed you the need for high accuracy simulation because you can you won't perform like surfing web watching uh, Netflix or like looking at photos or doing these things do not need quantum computing. Quantum computing are for those tasks which requires a lot of computational power. So even these simulations, which can be very simple, which can be done in a few hours, you don't really would like use quantum computing there. You will use quantum computing in bigger problem sizes, which are very much applicable in academia or industry. Anything that takes like week, one week at least, or many weeks or many months, and sometimes even many years. That's where this will be applicable. So uh, with that being said, my closing slide, um, here at uh, Boson Kusai, we are currently looking for a senior quantum computing developer. We are also uh, actively looking for quantum computing intern. These openings come and go. Um, and then multi-physics simulation intern with GPU programming in some way. Uh, for graduate students, uh, we are open to industrial academic collaboration. Like if you're looking for a project, we, we would be more than happy to talk to. Um, and we are also looking for research collaborations with universities. Currently, Boson QSI has uh, gained a lot of traction. We have won. We have, we have actually finished three in three competition, entrepreneur and business pitch competition. We have finished in top one position like we are the winners of them and then four of them we have been either runners up or semi finalists so we have a lot of interest coming towards our way and we are very much we, we belong from academy as you see the founding team so we, we understand and we want to cater towards india making india um, in quantum realm we really want to make, make put india into the map of the world saying that yes we are also we can also lead in some technology which is as disruptive as quantum. So that's all we have in the house for uh, everyone today. Please feel free to ask us any questions. You can reach out to us through these emails. Uh, we have our website and you find that it was on QSI is a good email to reach out. If you're looking for any job opportunities, check our website. You will have more information there and the kind of projects we are doing. So thank you everyone and thank you the organizers for having us. I would be happy to have to take any questions if the audience has. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank, thank you, you to sir. Dr. Aris Pichai and uh, uh, Abhijit Chopra, sir, for such a beautiful and insightful session. As an aeronautical engineer, uh, this session was really fascinating for me and hope our audience has enjoyed it thoroughly. Uh, thank you for such a beautiful talk again for uh, computational uh, quantum computation and uh, i will have a question i will start with myself so, mm -hmm. so this as a cfd person we really face problem on the mesh size okay mm -hmm. so when we increase the mesh size the computational uh, speed as well as the time uh, is exp it really increase exponentially so how uh, the quantum computing is going to help with that that's a very great question that's exactly to the heart of what we're doing so let's say if you currently, let's say you have a, a simulation, you want to do, you use 50 mesh elements, just, just saying randomly like a 2D problem, you are doing a CFD, 50 mesh point. You want to go 100, you know that you need more high, like higher accuracy, but you cannot go to that because it takes a lot of time or your software provider is not giving you that. What Boson QSI can do is basically that we can speed these simulations. So the same 50 qubit problem, you can go do 100, make a 100 qubit, uh, sorry, I should say, shouldn't say qubit, a 50 mesh, 50 mesh size problem can be made a 100 mesh size problem. And then you can use our software and it will give you the same accuracy, but better, uh, better turnaround time, meaning that it will take maybe two to three times less time if you use um, our software. So I will request Arnab uh, if they have any question, they have come up with that. And uh, uh, the questions are there in, uh, we are live on YouTube. So there are questions on YouTube, which I will take later. Uh, yeah, actually I would like to read out some questions from YouTube comments only. Uh, so 
yeah uh, someone has asked uh, can we do electromagnetic simulation uh, on this platform yeah we can ele do electromagnetic so in my very near future let me just quickly jump on it right now okay uh, and uh, another person has asked how is it different from comsol multiphysics software give me i will answer those questions very quickly just give me one second yeah so here is the answer to the first question um, yes you can do electromagnetic simulation so these all are the six fields we are starting to put it in our suit of softwares we are starting with uh, one of them which is structural mechanics and then we will go towards um, other fields so electromagnetic and electrochemistry will be part of it now answering the second question comsol so yes comsol is a traditional software it works mainly on cpu uh, the gpu technology is just starting to come up there they have done or uh, trying to do some benchmarking um, um, and and uh, where they lag is the part of quantum computing basically so that is that is exactly how we are saying we are not we are not trying to compete or replace these uh, traditional softwares these traditional software will still be in the place for students for for even for industry when they just want to get a very crude answer to where to look for basically where to do high fidelity simulation that's when they will come to us but but in rest of the places comsol comsol ansys altair these companies will be there thank you uh, we have got another question how quantum computing uh, is applicable to biotechnology so you can specify your applications sure so bio it's a very very good question um in biotechnology there are two i can tell you from my past experience two instances two research that i have personally seen closely i have not done it myself number one is uh, there was this uh, professor back at rutgers where i did my undergrad uh, they were looking at blood flow um in the blood flow they were basically looking at cancer cells and all these they were, and then further they wanted to make it to a level where cmd can predict those things uh, through simulation just through simulation um and can do so number two um is is this uh, there was this company called as heart flow which was originated from uh, rpi uh, spun out of rpi which is where i currently study on the phd uh, they were basically looking at they made an instrument which had this cfd thing which used to take pressure uh, near the heart and then were was able to give the results um, in real world time um not sure what's happening with them right now um, we were we, i was in touch with them but but yes these are the some of the two different applications that can be said other applications are definitely like drug delivery um disease like parkinson disease someone is trying to do something so it, not just in fluid dynamics but there are structure and thermal and other like electrochemistry and but then acoustic is a very important thing this becomes important in biot hmm. i hope that answers the question yeah uh, thank you sir for a great lecture so uh, i have a question like you are the one of the frontliners in start up uh, the context of quantum computing in india so how is that ecosystem uh, sorry in india great question thank you someone asked me this question i was hoping because this platform will really tell uh, like give me to to speak my words indian quantum system to be brutally honest is very much lagging behind um i have been part of many ecosystems myself i am interacting very closely with canada uh, with europe especially france and germany and i was i was there was a conference two weeks back qbe quantum business europe and i've interacted with lot many people it took them time it took them like 4 5 years to create that ecosystem that ecosystem currently doesn't exist in india and we are from that context we are far behind that is where boson to size trying to be not just the leader like whatever the startup and everything that's great i mean whatever is that but we really want to push the youth the the experienced people everyone get that excite excitedness and like excitement in quantum computing 
uh, I saw that with data science, AI, ML that happened four or five years ago, but but really quantum computing is still in, in its initial stage. And I am very much open along with Boson QSI to support any kind of activities that are going on. Even if people want to go make some startups in quantum computing, go and, and we are here to support that kind of startups. Um, mainly like hardware, there's nothing that India is doing, at least we don't know about maybe there's something going on the back um, government but that is sort of the like collaborations where i'm starting to bring the european and the canadian and the us and the australian people here in india through courses through certifications and and these are not to create any much hype for those on there this is to get quantum workforce ready this is the most important part nobody is going to succeed if we don't have the right intelligent smart people and india has abundance of that abundance i cannot tell you how much potential we as a country we as youth had it just where do we put our energy into and how do we put our energy into it? so indian ecosystem needs a lot and lot lot of input right now not just okay this was one aspect in terms of investment also india needs a lot just stating that we will give 1.2 billion dollars is not enough like that's not enough you need to pour down you need to trickle down you need to give it to startups you need to give it to people who want to create their startups so and and when this ecosystem develops it the last thing we want to do is compete with each other yes there are friendly competitions that happen here and there but we as india has to create an ecosystem where one company supports other company supports the third support so this whole ecosystem is there software hardware between software full stack all of these are things are possible and that is the idea of gaining from Europe and Canada right now, they are doing a brilliant job there. Um, and I'm asking people to come here, speak to us, create, like I'm, I'm literally asking them to come and create that for India right now. But thank you for bringing that question up. Really appreciate that. Uh, sir, uh, we have one more question from the audience. Uh, mm -hmm. How can an electrochemist use this for charge transport for atomic scale devices like memory? Like you mean the simulation part? Like how can somebody carry it? Right? Yeah, most probably that. Okay. That's uh, for simulation. Yeah. So very simply, all these uh, problems that we think, the one that um, the person who has a question mentioned, can be converted, uh, has, a, like, has a mathematical basis, basically. All these problems, once they become a mathematical basis, you solve it through some different techniques. And in that technique is where what we are basically doing right now with a few of the areas like structural fluids, some part of thermal. You bring us any use case, it always boils down to math. And when it, it, it is that math part, that is where we put this hybrid approach for us. And, and that also being said, hybrid right now, in future we might have pure quantum, but yes, with so called NIST era that will be here for five, six years, maybe seven years. Um, yeah, the, the hybrid approaches will stand out according to me. So, yeah, small answer, yes, that kind of simulation is possible. How is something that you have to look into some paper or something like that? I mean, if I sit down, I can tell you what mathematics is needed there and what software we can use. But yes, once we have our suit possible, then that will be possible through BQ5 also. Thank you. Sir, so one more question I have, like uh, you told that you will be providing the user uh, software, like uh, say cloud-based one, and you tie up with the uh, uh, IBM and all for the PUPU part. So are you going to install your software like directly in the PUPU, or again it is connected to the so it is connected to the cloud, again it is connected to the user, it's like that. Uh you are asking the right question. I just didn't understand the last part of it. Can you can you mind repeating it or maybe clarifying it? Yeah. So there are like three parts. Like QPU is one part, and your software cloud based is another part, and the user is another part. So is that the structure, or you are directly installing in the Q, in the QPU part your software? No, QPU part is just being utilized as an accelerator. We are not installing our thing on QPU. We are actually. We, so how SaaS work is basically there is a central system where everything is being stored. 
and that central part whenever users give some in instruction and if that needs some kind of simulation it will access the, the gpu the qpu and whatever but it is always in that central part it is it is stored so it is basically installed per se in a cloud the cloud server yes sir thank you, thank you sir for clearing our doubts uh, so in iit madras multiple uh, disciplines are working and uh, we are using the CFD phenomenon. So I'll be happy if you share uh, the uh, your software details and uh, contacts with our uh, audience. Sure. Okay, sir. So with this, I will wrap up this session. Again, uh, once again, I will uh, ask Arnab uh, to conclude. Uh, thank you, Abhishek, uh, for that insightful session. It was really application oriented. Like uh, we are from different backgrounds. I'm from mechanical, uh, Nitikit is from aerospace. So it brings together different phenomena from different backgrounds. And uh, yeah, so the research expo part was also like well accepted by the audience. And thank you for that. Yeah. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you. Just want to uh, say something is that. Um, Please do not hesitate to, to reach out to us if you have some ideas you want to share, you want to do something on your own. Um, we started in similar fashion. Uh, we are very young, um, but but one thing that we do, do uh, differently is basically we do not stop thinking about um, futuristic ideas. You always have to sow the seed once and for all and, and then just believe in your ideas. So, you guys and whoever is watching this, I, I really give you all the power and the energy that if you have anything that you want to do, do not hesitate to take it up. This is the right time. Never will you find the perfect time. So make the time perfect. So that's all I have for today. Thank you so much for everyone for patiently listening. And uh, thank, thank you so you, much, sir. IIT uh, Madras team, for inviting us. It's, it's a pleasure to speak with such a wonderful audience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for the opportunity, Abhishek. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Thank, Thank you for joining. Thank you. IIT Madras Research. The one of a kind ecosystem brings into reality the dream of government academia and industry collaboration. Here, the Department of Heavy Industry collaborates with the Indian machine tools manufacturers with support of industry partners under the enhancement of competitiveness in Indian capital goods sector scheme. enhances Hello. I think the video is not visible. So I'm sharing it like this. I'm sharing this. Mm -hmm.
The manufacturing competitiveness of Indian capital goods and aims to develop advanced technology solutions with industry collaboration. Hello. Our vision is to position India as a top three scientific super. Uh, hey Nitikesh, Nazir, uh, we can play the sponsor's video.
Nitikesh, the audio is not there. Anurag, uh, are you there? 